Welcome to the uh, 10th lab in the series. Uh, this is our, we started this at the beginning of the pandemic and uh, is, a, is a way to basically put, put information out, share our work, um, continue the dialogue about the, using data to tell the economic case for cities. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, three special guests today. Uh, Patrick Sieb, who's the Executive Director of Destination Medical Center uh, Economic Development Agency in Rochester, Minnesota. Along with him is his colleague, uh, Catherine Melberg, who's the Interim Director of Economic Development and Placemaking at the DMC. And the other project we're gonna talk about is Lou Oliver's project, who's the principal of Lou Oliver Incorporated, which is a uh, sort of your traditional neighborhood development um, in Fayetteville, Georgia, but it's a little different because it's connected to a large movie studio project in the area. And it's kind of a completely different animal, um, but sort of fun to talk about as a project. Um, little housekeeping beforehand, uh, we'll go probably about 40 minutes or so um, as a dialogue and discussion, uh, a short presentation from me beforehand to explain the projects and what we saw to show you the visuals of how it looks economically. Um, if you all have questions, we're going to take the final 10 or 15 minutes of questions. Kate Riba will moderate those. So put those into the chat and she'll make sure she asks the group um, those questions so you can engage the speakers. We're going to run for a, a full hour uh, to two o'clock and we're going to end on time promptly to respect your time. Um, our meeting rules are that everybody's mics and videos turned off um, and um, put your view on, on and, uh, to speak review, and um, we're gonna go ahead and run the show. So, so with that, let me introduce the guests. Uh, uh, first, we have uh, Lou Oliver, who is the principal of Lou Oliver Incorporated, an Atlanta-based urbanist and man master planning, uh, master planner and designer with more than a decade of experience in new urbanism and residential design. He envisions, designs, and implements whole towns. Um, he was a preferred design consultant of DPZ, Duana Peter Zyberg, um, and he's been on over 40 charrettes with them. Um, Lou has done a lot of master planning. He's got a lot of development experience, um, but really what comes to mind and we're going to talk about is the building of place and the quality of place and Lou's approach to uh, making architecture and quality spaces. Um, so he, he focuses on the, the experience of his site plans and his site designs and the architecture in his communities, and that comes out in the value of the work. Um, and he considers each of his plans uh, as a way to enrich the landscape of the environment. That's a purely private sector project we'll talk about. And then the public-private partnership is the work of the, the Destination Medical Center, or we will call it the DMC um, throughout this talk. But the DMC is a public-private venture that was created by the state of Minnesota. With, um, within Rochester to work with the Mayo Clinic. And Patrick Sieb is the executive director of the, of the DMC Economic Development Agency, uh, which is in Rochester, Minnesota. And it's the largest public private development initiative in Minnesota's history. Um, I would like to know, I think it's probably the largest public private development uh, a, a project that I've ever seen. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing what's going on. Um, and he's the executive director leading a, a team uh, to basically bring this, the, shape the, uh, and innovate the, the public investment in Rochester, um, advancing it to the 20th century, 21st century urban design practices. Um, he's, you know, by being a public private venture, it's not only working with the hospital, but also with the city of Rochester and Olmstead County and aligning the economic development goals. And we'll show the annual or the, the report method uh, that Patrick has put forward in, in explaining the economic investments in the community. Uh, working with Patrick is Catherine Mulberg, who's the uh, um, Interim Director of Economic Development and Placemaking with the DMC. And uh, we've, we worked closely with Catherine to basically answer the economic questions that they were seeking uh, for their, their annual report. And Catherine's focused on the triple bottom line of the of the investments and it incorporates environmental and social goals. And she's completed her undergraduate work in history of literature at Harvard University and holds a master's of architecture from Princeton University. So these are our three guests. Uh, we'll, I'm gonna bring them back in and turn on their screens in a, in a bit, but first we'll just go through the projects and why we feel that they're uh, relevant and important to talk about. Uh, we'll start with Fayetteville, Georgia, which is Southwest of Atlanta. Um, part of, it's, it's a county outside of, the, I think of Atlanta is pretty much in um, DeKalb and Fulton County. 
And then you have Cobb to the southwest and next to that one is Fayetteville County. You can kind of see the, the, the kind of sort of highway sprawl that's hitting the county. Fayetteville is in the center of, of, the, of the county. And um, this sort of highlights what's going on with Lou's project. Uh, incidentally, this big tall purple spike right here is a private building on the hospital. Coincidentally, since we're talking about the Mayo Clinic, it's kind of ironic that that has a big spike as well. But Lou's project is immediately adjacent to that. So zooming into the city, you can see the movie studios over here. Um, you'll see the old name of the movie studio on some of our slides, but this is called Trillith now. And right across the street from Trillith is the village uh, that, that Lou has been uh, that designed and has been working on. So it really stuck out like a sore thumb to us um, when we were doing the model. It's obviously the data speaks for itself, but architecturally it also uh, tells another story is the value of place in these um, very special little pieces of architecture and that that density is showing that it's producing value. Um, or another way of looking at it is this is housing in Pinewood Forest next to Pinewood Studios. Again, now, now it's called Trillith. That's Lou's project over here. This is housing as well. So that's equidistant to the studio. So design does affect value and also shows in the marketplace that it rewards as well. So this was a very powerful graphic to show that. And also as, as it's, this is just the, the total valuation side. If you lift the buildings off the earth and just look what it's done to the, to the dirt, this is the dirt value change. And you can see again, Lou's project right here and the value of the dirt under his buildings. So as we talk about the design quality of architecture, you can see that it actually uh, tr trickles that value into the soil beneath it because that's where the value of making place creates value in the land. Um, and this is a pretty powerful graphic to show that. So that's the, um, the, the Fayetteville project with Lou Oliver. We'll, we'll come back to this. I just wanted you to see the visuals of how it conveys and also the quality of the architecture uh, because that's pretty important. Design does matter uh, when it comes to value. Now for the DMC project in Rochester, um, uh, you know their their company takes it seriously. When we always use this statement in all of our presentations, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So part of this project was to me measure their effect in their community, and it's part of their reporting back to the state. Um, and I believe it was every five years, um, but you can pretty much tell the impact of downtown Rochester in this model right away. Um, it's just shooting off the map. And there's a, the, a building called the Gonda building, which is a, a, it's taxable even though it's part of the Mayo Clinic. Uh, it's full of offices and um, private sector uh, businesses. But again, it's that quasi public private um, typology that's adding that value back into the downtown. So when you have this economic engine, how do you build off of it and how do you expand beyond the Gonda building? And that's been the challenge of the DMC is to take that economic investment and potency of this massive investment and how do you cultivate an area around it? Obviously, these are a lot of jobs. There's a lot of import of patients coming into town and their families. That's a spin-off economy that's, that spreads around the community. And what does that do versus stuff outside of the city? Um, so we measured it and you can see the potency on a per acre basis, how much more potency, and you see it in the 3D model, is happening in the downtown area. And as you spread out into the region, you see the lower value return, which is the story that we see again and again and again, that that's, that suburban or, or new, new market driven stuff is actually driven by a system producing lower revenue return. So at a basic level, there's been $500 million of investment um, of Mayo Clinic investment and the private sector has followed suit with another $320 million of investment, which is tremendous for a city this size. So here's what it looks like. This is the, in 3D, the potency of those projects or another way of looking at it. Um, here's the investment change um, over the past five years. There's been uh, at, um, you know, close to $2 billion worth of value. So here's where they started four years ago on the left or five years ago on the left. And that's where they are today. You can see that value jump. So five years time, $2 billion of, of growth is kind of ridiculous. Um, and Minnesota has a quirky tax system where you have a tax value. We also have this thing called tax capacity, which is how much of your valuation is, uh, is taxed. It's not a straight system like in North Carolina where you're just taxed on value. Every state has different systems, but tax capacity 
is what matters in, in Minnesota. So the tax value has doubled. Uh, the tax capacity has gone up as well about 1.4 times because commercial product is, is, is a higher capacity than residential product. But although the residential units that are being built in the downtown are also far more potent than a typical residential development um, in, a, in a suburban uh, pattern. So that's that's the numbers. Uh, that's the growth. Uh, that's what's happening in in in, in Rochester, and it and it matters because that investment of growing um, ten million, eleven million dollars in property taxes covers that road cost that's within the area of of the downtown uh, many times over. Where that suburban environment, even though it's covering the cost of its roads, it's not pulling that much more than with the with that development pattern is producing. So just having some simple metrics and measurements, having uh, sort of the report, reporting methodology is a very valuable lesson. So with that, I'd like to bring the team back in um, and have everybody on, on cameras now. Um, and I'm just gonna start a conversation with um, some warm up questions to talk about this with, with uh, Catherine, Patrick and Lou. Um, and, and first I wanna maybe start with uh, Patrick and, and Catherine. How did the DMC, I mean, it's such a strange and interesting beast as far as a, a, a management system. Where did this come from? Could you explain that? Yeah, let me, let me take a crack at that. Um, and first of all, thank you, Joe, for uh, inviting us to participate and um, to your audience as they look through your participant list. I, I know many of the names um, because we all travel in the same circle and probably have been at conferences together. So um, let me just start by thanking you and, and really pleased to be with you and with Lou today. Um, Destination Medical Center was really born of the idea that the number one healthcare provider in the world, and this is independent rankings year over year, Mayo Clinic is in this relatively small town of 110,000 people. And it intends to grow. And Mayo Clinic said, whatever we are today, think of us as tenfold, um, you know, order of magnitude um, uh, growth in terms of our impact to the health and medical community across the world. And we want to continue to grow in Rochester, Minnesota, and we will. Um, however, we need our city to grow with us. And so the Mayo Clinic, uh, along with the city of Rochester, uh, visited with the state of Minnesota, the governor at the time, Governor Dayton, and came up with this idea of if Mayo Clinic can, commits to growing in Rochester, how could the state and the, and the municipality and the county work together to provide support for the public infrastructure necessary to allow the city to keep pace with this world-class um, uh, economic engine called Mayo Clinic. And this was about um, 2010, perhaps, that it was the concept was born and, and it uh, actually went in front of the Minnesota State Legislature in 2013 and probably for the first time in Minnesota history, uh, something was passed by the legislature in one uh, legislative session because it was so um, uh, well recognized across the state how important Mayo Clinic is to Minnesota's economy, not just Rochester's economy. You know, what's, what's interesting about the, from a, I guess the linkage between that typology of investment and the Trilith Studios is that you know there's there's tax credits that the state is very generous with in Georgia um, to afford that industry to come in. Is Lou, Lou, do you think that that would be a is that something that's implicit or known with the creation of the studio in the in in the um, the village? Do you think that would be a conversation that they would have? You're, you're on mute, Lou. Sorry for not having my glasses on. Um, <laughs> yes, it's very well known our um, our tax advantages and attracting the movie industry, and um, that's been something that um, Dan Cathy, who's the founder of the town, has capitalized on. So uh, we we have huge incentives, and it's allowed uh, Trillith to become the second largest movie production center in America in uh, less than five years. And I, I fully expect it'll, 
it'll uh, become um, number one within two to three more years. Lou, what's the um, the acreage? If you add the studio and the the village, I'm sorry, I didn't have that number off, off the top of my head, but what would you think the combined acreage of the two sites are? Um, 735 acres. So um, that that includes the studios, the expansion, um, the uh, uh, Trillith, the the town we're working on is 234 acres of which half uh, we've saved in green space um, and civic space. And so we're, we're, um, we're building on um, 132 acres. Did I do my math right? Yeah. And uh, we were able to do uh, 1400 residential units and a town center on that amount of acreage. And just for the sake of comparison, uh, Catherine and Patrick, how, how big is the, the DMC in acreage? Uh, if I do the math quickly in my head, um, I, it's, a, it's roughly a mile square. And okay. I think that might translate into 600 acres. Interesting. But I, I, I'm guessing somebody's got a calculator and they're probably doing I, the math. They're trying, probably doing the math behind the screen here, but <laughs> um, I think of it as around six or 700 acres. Okay. I, mean, I, haven't, I haven't thought about that or before this conversation, but it really is about the same area in the yeah. same project. There's a lot of parallel there. Um, and this is maybe both of you, both y'all can ask, answer, all y'all can answer this question, but um, there's, there's cultural paradigms on the way that people see development happen. Um, you know, in the case of Rochester, um, it's the suburban urban conversations. It's an isolated city that's not in the, um, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Metrosphere, um, you're dealing with a different sort of uh, urban experience. Um, I'd like to hear how you, your community responded to that or what are the challenges? And also with Lou, um, you know, it's not easy to do work and, and just kind of show up and do a village in, in Georgia. Um, and there's a lot of challenges there with the development review process, how people saw it. Um, but now in hindsight, what are you seeing as far as the... The, the market and how that's being responded. So if, if both of y'all, all y'all could maybe start with Patrick and what are the challenges and how your cult, community culture responds? Yeah, and I'll, I'll give Catherine the floor in, in a moment as well, but for your listeners and watchers, um, Rochester is a 150 year old city and it has um, gone through, you know, shifts in, um, in development patterns, much like any other city in the country and, you know, sort of the, you know, close in small town, Mayo Clinic really became a, a significant national player probably in the mid 20th century. Um, there was the kind of growth that took place in the 50s and 60s around the automobile and uh, IBM um, putting a, a significant footprint here in Rochester in the more suburban part of the city. And, uh, and so, you know, the, the generation of of uh, leaders in this community probably came of age during a more suburban style development. And, and that's really the shift that's happening, a shift that's happening, again, a shift that's happening elsewhere. And Catherine, you know, feel free to weigh in in terms of how that's, how that's playing out and what the conversations are like. Sure, yeah. And I would say what's really unique about Rochester is it's not just urban suburban, but it's rural, very close in, right? We, we have farming, uh, active farming still. Um, you know, not that far from Mayo's front door. Um, and I think that, as Patrick mentioned, sort of the core, because Mayo is such a you know, long time, uh, you know, center of the community. So the core was built in a different era, a pre-vehicle era, um, which, you know, a huge part of what the DMC is doing is um, introducing a bus rapid transit line. Um, because we recognize if the growth that is gonna occur over the next um, 15, 20 years, occurs, we're on a fixed street grid, right? Those, those streets are not getting wider. Um, so we need to get more people to the, the sort of Mayo-centered uh, downtown district um, with the same street grid from, you know, 120 years ago. Um, and so, you know, I think that is one of the bigger shifts, right, is rather than the kind of what we saw in the 20th century of the kind of moving out from the core, it's like, uh, you know, kind of way to continue to densify um, the downtown. 
And the other cultural piece here too is, you know, the DMC is uh, aiming to be America's city for health, right? And so how are we going to center health in all of the um, development decisions and uh, investments that occur within the district? And, um, you know, that's something that I think is very new um, for most people. Um, so that's another sort of cultural shift that we're working on. In, in Lou, how would you say, yeah. how would you say the response has been for uh, your community and how they saw the project coming in? Was there any resistance, and how do people feel about it now? Well, um, amazingly enough, there was very little resistance to the community coming in, and, and it's not what you would expect in Metro Atlanta, um, but it is on the south side. The south side's uh, been starved of quality development and the north side is uh, being strangled with traffic now. And so it, it was welcomed um, as um, newest, greatest uh, economic development, et cetera. Um, the uh, surrounding communities in, in this part of South Atlanta are very fluent, Peachtree City and Fayetteville. Um, they, there, there's also been a shift to um, older people needing to downsize. And of course they, they've got expensive tastes so, that, so they want a well-appointed house just on a, on a much smaller lot. And they've seen this happen in town and they've seen it happen on the north side. So it, it was really um, uh, not a very hard sell at all. Um, our uh, age group moving into the community, if I had to lump it into a couple of categories, uh, there would be 30-something-year-olds, uh, either singles or couples, and um, uh, there's some families, and then there are empty nesters with second careers. So all of these different groups of people accepted much smaller lots. Um, our typical lots there are 30 by 60 and 40 by 80. And uh, those were well received. And the new, the newest ones are even smaller than that with, with our smallest micro homes. The small micro homes are four to 500 square feet and they're on a postage stamp lot. And uh, the appetite for them has been enormous. They rent for um, double what Pont City Market rents for per square foot. And they sell at about 500 a square foot when, when um, our, our norm in Trilla prior to them was probably 300 a square foot, which is about, which is at least twice the, the uh, local uh, market rate uh, per square foot. So it's generated a lot of excitement and um, people have responded really well to it. And um, I, I think I think it really addressed a lot of needs. Catherine and Patrick, are you are you experiencing similar dem demographic shifts that what Lou's talking about? That once it's built, people are shifting their conventions, or there's a market shift in conversations with like the realtors or groups like that. Are you seeing a similar shift in Rochester? Well. I would say I think we have a somewhat different, um, yeah, different context. I think Minnesota as a state is, um, you know, aging. It's above the kind of national average for the average age. But I would say the growth in Rochester is seen more on the younger side of the demographic, with the influx uh, and growth of Mayo and the associated companies, biomed tech companies, essentially, that are also now locating in, in the Discovery Square subdistrict um, of the DMC. So um, I, I've primarily seen that there is kind of a bigger influx of people earlier in their careers. Um, and most of the housing development specifically, I think, is it has been geared towards that. Um, but I think that will continue to evolve. Okay. <clears throat> I'm gonna throw this one at Lou first um, and switch the order up. But uh, this is a, a question of, you, uh, you have a, a large development with a large developer. Um, a lot of times there's, there's questions of 
how do you how do you do how do you help, how do you help low uh, small developers when on a smaller budgets do similar types of development? What, what kind of advice would you give to an infill developer that didn't well, necessarily have a large project? Well, um, I think number one, you have to reduce infrastructure uh, down to a fraction of what uh, we would think of as normal, even in, even in let's say boilerplate new urbanism, um, you're gonna have street frontage, you're gonna have alley frontage. There are ways to do away with that street frontage as um, um, Marianne Curry knows who's on this call at, at her project in North Florida. Um, and it's by doing uh, green streets and pedestrian streets, which uh, enable you to take out, I'm gonna say every other street and just rear alley load it. And that's a, that's a type that's gained a lot of acceptance, especially at Trilla. Um, and it, it really takes a lot of cost out to begin with. And it, and it adds an amenity, which is a pedestrian way in a park. So uh, that's one way to take some cost out. The infrastructure, um, I can't speak much to how do you finance streets. Um, alleys can be, that cost can be incurred by the builders. Once you, uh, a master builder guild and you get lot takedowns, you can, you can absorb the alleys into uh, lot costs, let's say, and, and kind of defer that. The, um, we do a lot of green infrastructure. Uh, Trillith is on um, geothermal power of the for sale product. So we've got about a 200, 200 lots on geothermal. Um, we're working with a company who will um, bundle geothermal and solar and um, install that and provide financing for that. So you can float, you can kind of float that debt if the project's right, if, if everything's right on the project and they will do that. Um, there are some sites where you need um, water, you need um, wastewater treatment and the same company has an arm that will also bundle that and finance that as well. So I, I think it's something really attractive. I know we're, we're, we're using this particular company on a couple of projects. And I think you're gonna see just a huge emerging trend uh, in doing that because, because all of this is uh, really expensive. Well, also back, back to the pattern that you're creating with that small product, the small house, in and of itself, it's going to be, you know, there's there's a point at which the bottom doesn't drop out with the less square feet that you build because you still have to build a kitchen and the bathroom and stuff. But are you seeing that um, in many cities you you find folks with um, minimum lot sizes and they don't know where that rule came from, but they hold to it, even though you're proving that you don't necessarily need those lot sizes. Are you seeing a, a shift with that? Well, because. Um because the infill sites in Atlanta are so uh, dreadful, they're, they're usually places you would have never considered to build on for the past uh, 20 years. They're the leftover spaces, the spaces that are so steep, you can't possibly put anything on them. Or they're in the back of a strip club, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the Some city- people might live there. The city, what's that? <laughs> Some people might choose to live there. Yeah, some people, people <laughs> move into them in droves. So the city is so desperate for redevelopment on some of these lots that they will really be very flexible with you to begin with. Um, we, don't, we don't have many places we do master planning and projects where we're tied to a certain size of lot. Um, only because the places we do work are usually um, in the city or a project so large that we can almost write our own zoning code um, or in places like downtown Alpharetta or Marietta that already have um, the right codes in place uh, that allow for small lots and a lot of flexibility. So, and, and for Catherine and Patrick, how, how, do you, how would you handle this question? What's, 
What's your, what's been your experience with smaller developers or moving the needle in, from an economic standpoint on the small and infill or local development side? Yeah, this is a really, really interesting question. And, and one that I think we, so there's a couple of things that we've been trying to do. And, and I think it's, we're at the beginning of this. So, so much is set up to favor large developers, um, you know, maybe unintentionally, but over time it becomes hard as a small local developer to take on a project because of the, um, the cost burdens, the land costs, the, um, approval processes or regulations, et cetera, that just simply get in the way of a, of a small developer who doesn't have a deep bench to, um, you know, handle, you know, all, all parts of a, a development. And so one thing we have begun to do is we've made a commitment to um, when we use destination medical center public infrastructure dollars that we are commit, we, we require that a certain percent of those contracts go to women and minority owned contractors. Now that's a slightly different than what you're asking, but it's on the same continuum, which is how can we be more intentional about diversifying the development, uh, who gets to participate, who gets to, you know, who gets to um, prosper from all of this new infrastructure investment going on and the new opportunity being created. And I can think of an example and Catherine weigh in on this. There's a 60 acre site, five minutes from uh, a 10 minute walk from the, the core of the downtown former industrial site that has recently become available. And we've been doing a small area plan to start thinking about how do we break it up into bite-sized pieces? How do we create the street grid and the infrastructure? You can all picture a, uh, an industrial site that's largely uh, impervious, you know, and where, you know, vacant warehouse buildings, et cetera, with no street grid. And, and, and we're, we're in a process now to think about what does that development pattern want to look like? It's adjacent to a, a neighborhood of uh, naturally occurring affordable housing. It's on the river. And it just, this triggers for me, actually, a question we ought to be asking ourselves, Catherine, how do, we, how do we ensure that that landowner, the new property owner, is incentivized to work with small and local developers to take on bite-sized pieces of that, you know, 60 acre, probably 15 or 20 year development opportunity? And you, you actually just feel. You, you actually just walked right into the next question, which is, um... Uh, this this comes from uh, so, uh, someone in the, on the on the audience uh, that logged in gave us this question about it, achieving equitable miss, missing middle and yeah. equitable uh, micro mobility or active transportation. It, it sounds like what I'm hearing is that that's that next wave outside of downtown, where that mi missing middle typically transitions and blends into the neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah. This is this is such a great question and. And it's one, just simply getting the question on the table and start and starting the community conversation around this is, is itself a, a service to the community because people don't think about, you know, like how do we, this neighborhood I'm referring to adjacent to this um, 60 acre site is post-World War II, two bedroom, one bath houses, the homes that are, you know, in our marketplace, you know, sort of be in the affordability level for a, a, a nurse or a lab technician or a you know start, couple starting out and and how do we you know how do we transition that into a, a slightly denser development row houses townhouses um, how do we you know how do we make that a walkable neighborhood so you can live without a car while, while in this new neighborhood I'm talking about this potential new neighborhood that right now people wouldn't think of it as a car-free neighborhood, but it's it's actually one that properly you know contemplated could be a neighborhood where you could get by without a car, but for the occasional car sharing you might need to do to to uh, do a target run or something. Catherine, feel free to comment. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say we're also, you know, we're trying to move the dialogue for obviously, like many communities, there's a a ton of discussion about affordable housing and we're trying to move that into the next level of uh, conversation around affordable living and really thinking about it as not just the housing and the housing costs, but what the transportation availability is and what their utility costs are. Their sustainability is also a huge focus of the DMC um, so that we look holistically 
at making sure that we're kind of trying to align those investments as much as possible and align them with the demonstrated needs of the larger Olmstead County uh, area that we are in so that we, um, you know, our board, I think, thinks a lot about every time they're making an investment decision, what else are they foregoing? Um, and trying to really, um, as much as we can over this, you know, 20 year time period, um, make sure that we are selective about investments that are working for different tranches within the market. And Lou, I don't, and, and this may not be applicable in, in a Trulith situation and, um, or maybe it is, but in your experience and practice, how would, how would you see this question or answer it? Well, um, the missing middle housing we're trying to address in many ways uh, at Trillet from micro houses to townhouses. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of news houses. And I'm really excited about those because we've come up with some new prototypes that in plan look like an old ice cube tray where you can have three party walls and, and one facade. And, and for us, the facades are a lot of the money. I mean, just a lot of the finish, a lot of the labor windows. So the less facade we can have per unit, the better our budget is. We're working on these types that, uh, of course, they're gonna have to be highly attractive and sellable or we, or, or we would defeat ourselves. So we're working on we're working on that. We're working on housing schemes for elderly people that are more of um, if you remember this um, the Golden Girls, it's the Golden Girls model, and um, we think that's really going to pull housing costs down for seniors uh, with a kind of a chosen family model and maybe a universal health care giver. Um, so we're, we're working on that. That's one of our goals this year is to kind of crack that nut. Um, the, I have to say the green energy is going to work for what Catherine was talking about of pulling the cost down of the entire ecosystem, because we, we've got a lot of, uh, we've got our green energy. We're going to be doing our first, um, SIPs panel neighborhood, which we're, we've got a, We've got a group of 14 houses. We're going to be great breaking ground on May 1st. And um, I think our I think our power bills, we're going to have power bills of 40 and 50 dollars a month. And we're already hitting those in, in some cases. The um, net zero is something we aspire to. That last 15 to 20 percent is extremely expensive to try to make happen. But if we can get 80 or 85 percent there, we're going to be pretty happy right now. Well, since, since, you, since you brought up the, the facade and the need for putting a lot of attention there, in, in, the, in the prep call and in my past conversations with Lou, I, I love your analogies and your metaphors. The Golden, the golden Girls house is, is brilliant. And I, I think the Mayo Clinic needs to steal that one. It'd be a typology that could work particularly around the Mayo Clinic. Um, but you had mentioned that the jewel boxes or the delicious architecture is your intent in using the architecture as a way to draw people into that environment and make place. Could you expand on that a little bit? Well, if, if you go to the land of Oz and, and you have live in a house that's 20 by 20 feet with a thatched roof, it better be completely delightful with hollyhocks in front of the front door. And you've, you've got to create um, something that has a yummy factor that is visually delightful and it's not very hard to sell when you do that. I mean, of course, there needs to be plenty of light, beautiful ceilings, whether they're low or high and, and good finishes. Otherwise, it's just going to be looked at as, as uh, cheap, small houses. And that, that would be be lethal to our sales, I would think. I, I don't think we could sell anything, but 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 you can sell a you can sell a jewel box. There's no question. That's great. Um, makes me miss architecture and practicing architecture, um, and that's really the qualitative aspects of building building our, our world. 
uh, I think it was Leon Creer that said that we have to think of every piece of architecture as building one small piece adding to the whole world. And it's seeing that this builds a bigger, a bigger place. Um, this is a more complicated question. We've all read our Jane Jacobs. Um, she talks about the effects of cataclysmic money, large investments that tend to be these whales that drop in that have tremendous amounts of risk. Um, to, to some extent, both projects that we're talking about today are large risk projects that have big effects that could be cataclysmic. Um, in both cases, they, the, the projects have been working and working out. But how would, from two totally different perspectives, but how do you manage risk uh, and think about your, your investments in a, in a to do home, no harm uh, uh, sort of world? And we'll start with uh, uh, the DMC first on this one. Yeah, I mean, we have, there's no doubt um, that we have suffered from the risk of cataclysmic investment and the speculation associated with it. Uh, just to put it in scale for, for um, participants, um, Destination Medical Center is, has been promised $585 million of public infrastructure support over the next 20 years. And, 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 uh, and that, you know, people didn't, first of all, didn't hear it as coming over 20 years. I mean, I think people thought there was $585 million in the closet in our office and we could just pull it out and drop it and, and put it into projects whenever we wanted. So didn't really understand that that's a, you know, it's, it's a tool over a 20 year period. Um, a lot of speculation in the marketplace because of, because of this. One of the things I've tried to say is that every city is changing. Every city is changing. There's a difference between those who are victim to the change versus those that are being intentional about their change. And what, what Destination Medical Center represents is Rochester having an opportunity to be intentional about the change. And, and, uh, and, and I think one of the things, and Catherine, I'd love for you to talk about this, but some of the strategies, so, so, so one, uh, that warning is, is, has, is a healthy warning and, and one that we have definitely suffered um, from. But we are we're trying to turn that conversation around and help people um, think about how we can use this as a tool to get what we want, not be a victim to it. And Catherine, maybe just talk about some of those, those tools that we're creating. Yeah, I think the first tool that really comes to mind is we're utilizing what, what we call the community co-design process. Um, and so really trying to, um, and I imagine others here on the call are probably trying to explore these in their communities as well, but rather than seeing community engagement as something where you know, a design team and the, and, you know, staff have figured out, you know, A, B, and C, and, and now we go to the community and we say, okay, what do you like, A, B, or C? Um, it's really um, turning that process on its head and starting with the community from the beginning of the conception of the project to allow their lived experience and expertise to really inform the process. So, you know, that's an approach we're taking with all of the transportation investments and public realm investments um, to, to start there first. Um, and so they are kind of guiding us, hopefully, around some of these um, risks that could come with so much investment happening so quickly. Um, I would also- could I, just, could, I just, could, could I just put a finer point on that, Catherine? What we are now saying to our design teams is that it's not good enough. Your learned experience, your learned expertise is not good enough. We, you need on your design team people with lived experience and you need to hire them and pay them and make them a part of your design team, even though they're not professional architects wow. or designers or engineers. What they are are people who use mobility or transit. What they are are people who live in a, you know, re rely, rely on a wheelchair to get about. Or they are people who come from an immigrant community who have different kinds of uh, uh, points of view. They need to be on your design team uh, and they need to be held accountable. So they get paid to be on the design team, but they're held accountable to connect to their communities, their networks, so that we end up with a richer, better design that is both benefits by the expertise of professionals, but is really shaped by people who, um, who have lived experience that, that, um, that ultimately is going to you know, make, it, make it work. I'm sorry. If, that's all right. If, 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 if you all seen um, 
like you 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 have an, an like an obsession with measuring managing reporting feedback measuring managing reporting feedback but you're on this loop the way that you all behave and mm -hmm. have you seen that uh you're in a public private partnerships is is, is, is that affecting the way that government typically doesn't respond at that feedback loop is typically more political it has a different cycle is is your practice of building place is that affecting the government interaction as well yeah i think it is and i think if what i mean one we have a very good municipal government here and really good professional colleagues at the at the municipality um, that said they know that we are stronger in measurement and in community participation and in i mean there are some things that we're that we're better at, that we have greater core competencies, and they respect that and value that. And one of those things is this constant, this constant learning, this constant, you know, what worked well, you know, what's the. Uh, I'll just give you another example. Uh, the amount of disruption going on because of construction uh, is is really, you know, hampering businesses and could hamper and and as it does in any city, but we've started this practice we call business forward. And we say that every construction project, if you're a bricklayer or a plumber or an electrician, you need to rethink your role. What your role is, is your role is business prosperity. Your role is community development. You may be laying bricks, but what you really are is about community prosperity. And so think about your job. Uh, you know, when do we schedule the sidewalk replacement? When do we, you know, when do we, um, uh, you know, scheduling the, when do we schedule the jackhammering? Do we do it when it's convenient for the construction worker or do we do it when it's con convenient for the hotel guests? And it's really flipping on its head how, um, how we go about projects. And to, to Lou, the, 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 the risk and, and I mean, obviously this is a very large project. Um, how, how is risk talked about within your development and the effects that it would have uh, within its marketplace? Well, we don't talk about this. It's kind of a taboo uh, subject in the <laughs> plan of developers because all of them are one step uh, uh, away from this uh, disaster. Um, if, we, if we see the lessons learned 14 years ago, but um, well, we limit, we limit the risk because when we, when we do the master plans and the basic uh, building, um, the, we assemble our monopoly house pieces, whether they're multifamily or single family. And generally our blocks of, are of such a size that we can flex uh, up or down in size. We can, we can go single family or we can do townhouse. And so we, we know we kind of understand our kit parts and we're, we're able to adapt to the market, which seems to change every six months. Uh, you can you can have a run of sales that are uh, 1.2 to 1.8 million dollars, 1.2 to 1.8 million dollar sales, and the next year you will kill it on micro houses all of a sudden. So you have to be ready and kind of quick on your feet for those changes, and also um, you have to understand who your buyers are, if, if there are a lot of singles moving in, you quickly adapt to that. If, if, if families are moving in with a lot of children, you can adapt quick, quickly to that. But I heard somebody just say, you, you need seasoned people on your team who, who know how to respond um, pretty fast and they're very flexible. Well, and uh, actually, uh well, we're going to keep you, Lou, and we'll, you, since you mentioned this earlier with the geothermal, um, you know, the, the conversations are now becoming more mainstream, talk about climate change and adaptability. Um, you know, I remember in 2006, uh, it was like we couldn't even talk about this when, when the evidence started coming out large and also with the Al Gore's movie um, making this more mainstream. You, you mentioned geothermal in this project. What what other um, what other conversations are you experiencing in your practice that that that, that make this relevant? Well, um, we are in a um, I would consider Atlanta definitely a, a receive zone where where a 
receive zone from uh, New York, California, especially Florida right now, um, as people are sensing um, rising sea levels and that that threat's going to increase, uh, I believe. So we're seeing a lot of this and we're talking to different towns about strategies to reinvent themselves and be able to prosper with an influx of population. Um, there are, you know, there are several towns in greater Atlanta that have done a very good job at that. Marietta, Alpharetta, Woodstock, there, there are several others. Um, the bulk of them are not doing a very good job with it though. I mean, they're continuing to widen highways. Uh, we still, I mean, we, we said sprawl was dead 10 years ago. It positively is not dead. It's, it's back on its feet and it's consuming everything in sight. So it's, it's kind of a big, uh, it's a big problem. Um, so we have, our personal mission is to begin educating these towns on how to reinvent themselves, how to, how to prepare their downtowns, extend their neighborhoods and do it in an aesthetically pleasing way, uh, a, a way that can allow economic prosperity and can um, minimize environmental impact. And, and we're very committed to that. Uh, in North, Northeast Georgia, where I live, we're in a mountainous area, we've got a massive, uh, I'm gonna call it a biosphere with several towns containing a fairly large mountain range with the Appalachian Trail going over it. So we're gonna be, we're gonna begin to strategize and create documents uh, to present that can show these towns how to prosper, how to uh, preserve and, and showcase the biosphere which they surround and hopefully cause um, uh, less damage and, and achieve a lot more um, uh, quality of life. Thank, thanks, thanks, Lou. And, and also with, with, with the... Um... With the geothermal, was that was that just a um, was that just a business case that was made to make that relevant, or was the a sympathetic uh, idea that came from the development? Um, well, the, the geothermal um, has many um, um, advantages. I'm not sure exactly what you're what you're asking. Well, well, like, how did that how did that come to being that someone's like, oh yeah, let's pay for that and get that done? That's I mean, it's it's got positive environmental benefits. Yeah, it makes sense financially, but it's also different from what people typically do. Yeah, well, so we started doing geothermal at Serenby years ago on a continuous loop. It, it was a it was a big success. I mean, the market received it well. We discovered there was no real advantage to a continuous loop. You can do it with individual wells just as easily, and you can uh, phase it a little more carefully. And if a loop goes down, it doesn't take 10 houses with it, it takes one house with it. Um, so that's been an easy sell. It also cleans up um, cleans up everybody's yards and courtyards because you don't have air conditioning sensors uh, all over the place. So um, we kind of just tripped into this relationship with this geothermal company and, and solar and we started thinking about it um, in our own developments, which we're doing of how do we pay for this? And um, we can, again, we tripped into a solution and proposal to them that uh, they create a financing mechanism for it. And it turns out to be an extremely good investment with very uh, high returns on the dollar. Uh, the consumer saves a lot of money and, and actually um, opt for a buyout. Uh, they can buy their system out. Um, so it's very flexible. There's nothing you can invest in that's going to pay the, the returns that you do with um, green energy. Um, and we're starting to see this um, model um, emerge in uh, aquaponics as well. Uh, there's, a, there's an architect in Metro Atlanta who's done not one but two now and the, the latest one is about an acre under roof. 
and it's it's paying 18 percent returns on the dollar wow. so that is another component we're looking at um if you're looking at infrastructure, it can also be agricultural infrastructure. And, and I firmly believe this is the way of the future uh, because it's chemical free. You can, you can harvest fish, produce, and um, it's, it's very rich nutrient, nutrient rich food. So we're, we're just beginning to look at all of these big issues and conceive of them as infrastructure issues. How do we implement them and how do we finance them? Okay. Yeah. Catherine and Pat Patrick, are you having similar conversations? Yeah, so I would say kind of big picture, right? We Minnesota sees itself as, you know, a state that's going to be receiving climate refugees, right? Like as as the temperatures rise, we um, you know, are remaining in a more temperate uh, zone. And so, you know, at a state level, I think they're anticipating more and more people coming to our region of the upper Midwest. Um, and then the sort of main climate threat that we face is uh, extreme rain events, essentially. So how do you um, mitigate against those? And um, so as part of the DMC, you know, we have a I'd like to give a shout out to our colleague, Kevin Bright, who is a full time focused on exactly this issue um, and sort of takes a lot of leadership in the community and collaborates with so many different entities. So Rochester Public Utilities Grid will be 100 percent renewable by 2030. So that's not that far off in the future. So for building buildings today, they should be all electric, right, because we're going to have a renewable grid not that far off um and you know he's working on district energy systems and we have green infrastructure um, incorporated in these transit um projects that we're we're trying to invest in and um so you know this is really i think central to the the whole project and as i mentioned earlier um health human health uh you know is the is the goal here um with the dmc so you know that's a, a a very clear marriage between this this issue. Well, this is great. Well, we we are you nailed it, Catherine. We're right on time. <laughs> it's one fifty nine. Um, <laughs> no, no, this is awesome. Uh, so I want to I want to thank you thank you all for your time time in this and your participation. These are stories that need to get out. These are models that need to be replicated. Uh, you all are doing amazing work uh, as a as a public private partnership in lieu your projects are stunning. Um, I wish more people could go through them and visit them. You really have to walk through your spaces to appreciate the, uh, the quality in, in care and attention to all those jewel boxes. Um, so, so with that, I want, I want to thank everybody for your time. It's two o'clock um, next month uh, as, our, as our next presentation. We're actually going to be talking about public wealth investment. We're going to have Dog Detter from um, uh, Stockholm, Sweden, talking about public wealth funds using municipal assets uh, as shared community wealth building, um, as well as a local experience from uh, Rachel Goldsmith out of Transit Realty in Boston, which is essentially the holding company that handles the Transit Authority's real estate that uses it for public-private uh, development. Uh, similar twist on uh, the DMC, but more at a municipal uh, scale level. Um, so we Feel free to join us all again next month for that or watch it on, on our YouTube channel. And uh, if you need to reach us, uh, reach out to Kate Riba or Caitlin Nellis uh, Masters and that's their uh, emails. And uh, also we will have this on our website. Uh, we have all of your emails. We'll send you a blast to, so that you can have this video. And um, thank you for coming to the, the lab and we'll see you at the next one.